All right, so the day's finally here. Heroku has decided to discontinue their free service options. So today we're gonna to be taking a look at some alternatives to Heroku. Uh, so this will be web hosting both for uh, dynamic sites, so full on servers, like a full tech stack, as well as web hosting options for front end or static only websites. So anything that uh, doesn't have HTML rendered through like templates or anything like that, uh, will work through the static options, and those are generally pretty easy to find a free alternative. I just want to start off by taking a look at the uh, Heroku email they sent out. So they just basically tell you they're discontinuing the free dinos, which is your servers, the Postgres option, and the Redis option, which is uh, your basically your, your database and your PubSub database. So all of their options are no longer free because Salesforce is taking over. So if we look at the actual Heroku like mission statement that they put out, basically they're just blaming the customers that they have to get rid of all of these free options. Because of course we can never take responsibility as a company and say, we just wanna make more money. We have to say, well, the customers are asking us to preserve that uh, security experience by reducing the free offerings we have because we accidentally leaked all of the uh, GitHub secret keys that we had on the service and people were upsetty spaghetti. So now, uh, starting in November, we won't have any of those free options anymore. So yeah, it's always the customer's fault. It's never the company's fault. Ha ha, funny how that works. Anyways. If we take a look at the current market share, we can see that Amazon has the biggest market share by far. Then there's Microsoft, then there's Google, and then there's the next 10 companies combined, and then there's the rest of them. So we're gonna be taking a look at some of the big options. I'm not gonna be looking at Microsoft Azure because I've never used it before. Uh, and I think that Google and AWS cover enough of that. And quite frankly, with Microsoft dropping like hundreds of billions of dollars on buying up an entire gaming industry, I feel like they probably have enough money at this point. but. Uh, yeah, so we're going to be taking a look at some niche options because as it said here in the article, um, they're currently suggesting in the cloud computing industry in general that smaller cloud infrastructure providers should focus on like regional or service specific niches as opposed to being broader uh, service providers. So we're going to be taking a look at both uh, broad providers like AWS as well as niche providers like Cloudflare Pages or uh, uh, Render.com or even like Firebase and stuff like that. Although Firebase does fall under Google, which is a little bit weird, but whatever. We're gonna start with DigitalOcean because this does have two months free with an affiliate link, which helps me out. And I no longer have free hosting for my tutorials. So of course I'm gonna plug the first thing that helps me. Basically, uh, if you sign up for DigitalOcean with the referral code in the video description, you get two months of free hosting with like $100 credit for those two months. And then if you eventually spend $25, they credit $25 to my account, which I then use to make more tutorials. But what do they actually provide? Well, they're kind of like a full service provider to an extent. Uh, so you can see here the list of things they provide, including load balancers. Uh, but the main things you're probably gonna care about are droplets and apps and maybe functions. So if we take a look at droplets, these are just gonna be your basic uh, dry cut Linux distributions, right? Like if you wanna spin up an Ubuntu server, you can do that. You have a whole bunch of different options, but if you click on basic, you come down here and you go down to the $4 a month option. After your two month affiliate link expires, if you use it, uh, it'll just be $4 a month from there. Now I have seen websites like GoRails. I'm pretty sure in a podcast, Chris from GoRails said that he scaled it up to like yeah, right here, 65,000 web developers. Uh, so they got 65K users and they're running on like a $20 DigitalOcean droplet, I think. I think even the, the database is running on that same server, which probably isn't the best practice, but I mean, it's worked for them, so you can't really complain. Um, so yeah, this is an option. The other thing is you can go to the app section and this is gonna function a little bit similar to like Heroku, where you have... Um, like pers non-persistent uh, servers. So every time you deploy to these by updating your GitHub or your GitLab, it will wipe the database that's on that node. So if you have like a user base that you wanna keep, you're gonna have to have the $5 a month app and you're gonna have to have like a $7 a month database. So personally, although this is easier to deploy, I would say you probably wanna go with a droplet just because it's $4 a month and you can have the database on droplet. Uh, the other thing is with the droplets, you can also do quicker deploys if you go over to the marketplace. 
Uh, this will allow you to do like a one-click deploy for a MERN stack or a WordPress website, which I've covered on the channel before. So if you're looking to, <laughs> assuming this will work, if you're looking to uh, deploy a solution that's like commonly set up like WordPress right here, you can do that. You can scroll down and you can see what their options are. In this case, WordPress is going to require a $6 a month droplet. So that is something to be aware of. It will be slightly more if you go with one of these options because that's what they've deemed as necessary. Whether that's just a cash grab or not, nobody knows. But uh, other options are like you can go for a full Ruby on Rails stack, which will also be the $6 a month option. And then for all of these, you can just add in your SSH key. You'll SSH in just like a regular Linux server and you'll have access to those. Now, the next thing we can talk about is, of course, the elephant in the room, which is AWS. They have the biggest market share, but they also have the largest offering of products and solutions. If I go over the products list here, you'll see it has a scroll bar just for the first level of categories to give you an idea. There's stuff for machine learning, which uh, the fact that there's this many options for machine learning is absolutely insane. There's options for gaming. There's options for IoT. Um, there's no options for Web3 because gross, can you imagine? There's quantum computing options. You get the point. Uh, they do have free tiers. Now, some of the free tiers, like the EC2 instance, which is the equivalent to the droplet, this is going to be 12 months free. After that, you're going to end up paying for whatever the free tier or for whatever the EC2 instance price is. It's probably 5 to $7 a month. Uh, but you also have options that are uh, not just locked into that uh, EC2 instance. So if you need like a S3 instance, this will be useful for your image storage. In the case of DigitalOcean, that'll run through spaces. It'll also be five bucks a month. And basically it's just a dedicated place where you can push images or files to that you can then retrieve if you have something like active storage in Rails. Here you have an S3 storage. It's five gigabytes of standard storage and it's free for 12 months. After that's probably like five bucks a month. They also have like RDS instances, DynamoDBs, and like Lambda functions, et cetera, that you can run here. Uh, it, it's just going to depend. And I think 750 hours is generally the amount that is in a month. Uh, so that's probably what they're telling you here. Now, the next option is the Google Compute. Now, these are nice for two reasons. One, it's not AWS, but it's still Google. So that's really kind of like not the best pro and con. But the main one is if you're a student, a lot of professors and universities have deals with Google where they'll give you like three to five hundred dollars worth of Google Cloud credits. The other thing is they allow you one free E2 micro instance per month, which is the equivalent of like the, the four dollar digital ocean droplet that we talked about earlier. They have other options here as well, like the app engine and cloud build, et cetera. But the main one you're gonna to wanna to look at is the e, uh, E2 micro instance. Now they also talk about the Firestore here, which is something that we're gonna be talking about in a second. If we go over to Firebase, they also have free options. So if you're going with like a, uh, like a digital ocean app and you're paying the five bucks a month, you could probably get away with like a Firebase backend if you're using something that's like JavaScript based. You have your JavaScript front end set up on some app or droplet and you have your backend running through Firebase. Now, we'll also talk about like static sites and how you can use them. I'm not entirely sure if you could use them in conjunction with uh, a Firebase data store. That might be something to look into in like a tutorial or something. It's just something I'm thinking of right now. But uh, in general, you can probably get away with your database usage if you use something like Firebase in the background or like Supabase, I think is the other one. I just don't know if Supabase has a uh, free option. So let's just go check that out right now because I'm totally unprofessional. So yeah, it looks like Supabase also has a free option. So this is a Firebase alternative, I believe, that allows you to uh, do some similar stuff. And it looks like it supports up to 50,000 monthly active users, which is going to be far more than you'll need for like a free option. So what does Firebase actually do? Well, they're going to give you two different options. It's going to be like a regular read, write database, or you're going to have like a real time database, I believe. And depending on which one you need, you can select between the two. Uh, but there's also a whole bunch of other options you can go through. Basic idea is your billing is going to change slightly between the two. So there are instances where one is better than the other because it'll be cheaper as it starts to scale up. But the nice thing with this is it's just a pretty easy and seamless a process to scale up. It's just going to run through some of the Google stuff because Google does own Firebase because as we've learned, there's three big companies that own the rest of the world at this point. But okay, let's take a look at something like render.com. This has been talked about a lot today. Uh, basically, it seems to have like static site hosting as well as service hosting. 
and it also has like a Postgres option, which is nice. And you can see here it is $0, but there's a caveat. It's $0 for the first 90 days. So that is something to be aware of. And it's similar for Redis, but the Redis option is actually not persistent. So if you go with Redis and you have like a PubSub database where you also want to store those messages, that's not going to work. You can't do that on the free tier. So that is something to be aware of, but they do seem to give you quite a bit of options here, including 100 gigabits uh, or gigabytes of uh, bandwidth per month, which is pretty cool. And it also has continuous deployments from Git, which means it sounds pretty similar to uh, Heroku. I've never used this one, but it's been talked about so much today that I thought I would mention it just in case. Next one is going to be Hatchbox. Now they do have a 14 day free trial, which isn't great, but because my channel is primarily focused on Rails developers, this is built by the same person that runs Go Rails. So it's Chris from Go Rails. He has a YouTube channel. He's very well known in the community. They do most of the setup for you and most of the, the management of your application. And they're gonna allow they're gonna allow you to host this on like AWS, DigitalOcean, Linode, etc. So you can use those free options probably with this, I guess. I don't know, um, but it is something worth looking into if you specifically use Ruby on Rails, which I realize won't be everyone that watches this. Next option we have is a really weird one that I found out about today. It's Cloudflare Pages. It seems to work just like GitHub Pages. Uh, but it runs through Cloudflare instead. This is going to be a front end only solution where you can't have any like dynamic content on the page. So if you have HTML templates that you're rendering, like let's say you have a Rails engine that renders HTML templates, that's not gonna work. But if you have a React app or a Vue app or a Hugo app or Svelte, this will work for you. Now, the nice thing about the Cloudflare pages as opposed to the GitHub pages, which we'll talk about in a minute here, um, they do have like unlimited sites, of course, because it all runs through GitHub repos pretty much, but they have, if I can find it because it's sort of hidden here, um, they have a bunch of like three minute guides for a whole bunch of frameworks. So if we take a look at one of these, it'll actually show you how to deploy these things. Uh, so in this case, it's looking at the React app, but as you can see here, there's a Blazor app, a Brunch app, I don't even know what that is, Hugo, Jekyll, Next.js, you get the idea. Like it's everything under the sun that you can need. But you'll notice all of these are front end frameworks. There's nothing on here that's like a Mern app or an actual web app. They're all websites. Again, the difference between a website is, is static and the difference between that and a web app is it has that dynamic backend where you can have some sort of persistence for your user base. So if you do need that persistence, you probably don't wanna go this route. But if you need a front end and you're looking to get hired somewhere as like a React developer, this is a great way to have like 50 per portfolio projects hosted online that you can just point people to. In that vein, I did a tutorial which used GitHub pages. I've actually done quite a few because it's completely free to set up. All you need is a GitHub repo and I can actually walk you through the entire tutorial right now. You go to the settings in your GitHub repo, you go down to your pages tab on the left here, and then you just quickly set, uh, click the button that says enable GitHub pages or whatever. And then you have the option to either deploy from a GitHub action. So these are your actions that run when you push up to your GitHub repo, there'll be a background job that runs and I can actually just go ahead and uh, open that up right now and you can take a look. So every time you run a GitHub or a Git push to a specific branch, it'll do whatever your actions are set up to do. So here it's like a build action and the deploy action. The build tries to build the application. If it runs into errors, it'll tell you what went wrong. And then after it builds, it'll then try to deploy it to a GitHub page. And if you set it up to run off of the main branch like I have here or like some other side branch, then every time you push to it, it, it can automatically update your deployment. What does your deployment look like? Well, in the case of this application, it's just a uh, basic bare bones, uh, like procedural block game where you can like place water and stuff. It was just something I did a tutorial on and I wanted a quick front end for it because it's just a uh, basic HTML page with some JavaScript. So it's really simple stuff, but I needed a place to host it so that I could show people how this thing in the video works so they could take a look at it. And you can see here, I can like navigate between the pages, which requires some fancy logic there because it's like a relative link relative to the GitHub repo. So you do need to be a little bit careful with deploying like this, but overall it's just pretty bare bones, push it up and you're good to go. Another thing I've done with this is like the pathfinding visualizer application. So this is like uh, if you've ever seen the Clements video on how he got hired at Google, where he did a couple of different pathfinding visualizers. This is a pretty common like 
uh, pathfinding application to go through. This is a React application. Last one was just basic HTML. This one's React. Uh, but this is pretty common for like showing interviewers that you at least know your your basic like pathfinding algorithms. I went a bit further with the procedural terrain because as you can see, I have like a bit of a fixation with that. Uh, but this is something that is worth like being made aware of uh, because there are just front end developers out there and this is by far the easiest way to do it. You just push it up to your repo and you're done. So hopefully some of these or at least one of these was like something you didn't know about and something you can now use. Uh, because yeah, it's kind of cringe as a Heroku is discontinuing their free support. Of course, things can't be free. Uh, they need some way to recoup the costs, but it is really, uh, questionable that they're saying it's the customer's fault for wanting a basic level of security, uh, because they leaked a bunch of SSH keys. <laughs> so yeah. Um, and the final thing I want to say is if I did miss a hosting service and you want to do everyone a favor and share it in the comment section, the only thing I ask, because I do appreciate if you do that, the only thing I ask is that after you leave the comment, you open up a private tab by clicking over here and clicking on like uh, wherever the private tab button is, the new private window or whatever it is in your browser. Go to the video URL and just make sure your comment appeared. Uh, the reason why I say this is because YouTube has this really bad habit. If I come over here and leak my revenue for the month, um, they have this really bad habit of uh, in the comments over here, the held for review section. If there's a website in the link, and I always forget this exists, but if they have like a website in the comment, they always get flagged for uh, like this is most likely spam. It doesn't matter who they are. It's ridiculous. I have it set to not filter any comments because I still do the comment filtering myself, but it still gets thrown in here. So uh, it would be nice if you checked, otherwise you might be like unintentionally shadow banned with that one comment because YouTube thinks you're spamming and advertising some inappropriate website on their platform. So yeah, just check it out. It, it, you can leave the comment, maybe I'll see it in here, but like if you don't see it there, uh, maybe just leave another comment after you leave the first one that says, hey, I left a comment, but it looks like I'm shadow banned. Or you can even DM me on Twitter. Uh, it's just at Dean Iocom and just let me know and I'll take a look. But yeah, hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully one of these options works for you uh, and hopefully I'll see you in a future video.